Hello again, everybody. Welcome to the Untitled Awesome Podcast with Joe. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to the Untitled Awesome Podcast with Joe Hurdy. Or as it's come to be known, the ramblings of a 22-year-old who feels like he's 75. <sighs> my apologies. It's been a while since my last one. Things just been so crazy around here. Um, let's see. Oh, a new term started for class. And I did tell my cousin Sarah that I would uh, share this little gem of a story with her. Uh, First term ended for classes and our final project, if you will, was that we had to do a monologue um, that we'd been working on for the past couple of weeks. Uh, as a mock audition so we actually had a casting director who we had never met had no idea who he was uh, he was brought in to basically judge our performances so that was nice and awkward um, it was a good experience very nice um, but so I did my monologue nailed it and then afterwards uh, our teacher had told us that have a joke prepared i'm like oh okay you know i got a million of those i'll be here all week folks so i went and they're like okay the post interview not too worried about it apparently they actually pay attention to these resumes that we sent in and after my monologue was finished they said so uh according to your resume it looks like you do impressions i'm like oh crap that's right because I auditioned for a student film, and it was a comedy, so I'm like, okay, well, I do some voice impressions sometimes. Maybe we'll just put that down for, you know, other skills. So I did that, and then I was in such a rush. Yeah, I know. I can't believe I'm slacking in an acting class, but it happens. So I used the same resume. So I was not prepared for this at all. And they had just made me sing a song so I was already feeling a little vulnerable I sang if I were a rich man by the way yeah turn back the clock actually after I sang it they were like wow good we were expecting something a bit more current but okay oh my god dang it but so they uh, asked for me to do an impression I'm like oh my gosh what what am I thinking what am I thinking and of course I didn't want to wait too long so the first thing out of my mouth was and I think to myself what a wonderful world they died laughing (laughs) that was Louis Armstrong by the way probably not I I swear it went better there but cousin Sarah has been asking for that Louis Armstrong impression so there it was but they thought it was hilarious, and this was followed by, so you only do singing impressions? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's just the first thing that popped into my mind. Uh, so yeah, there was that. And since then, acting two is pretty emotional so far. I have a new improv troupe that I'm a part of. That's a lot of fun. Instead of people being from you know 19 to 63 everyone's in a nice tight little 20 to 26 year old range we all get along great and there's only one girl so we make all the fart jokes that we want and we don't feel bad about it at all it was her fault for signing up for that class in the first place anyway let's see what else is new nah who cares let's move on to my feelings so uh, now that i've since moving in and now that I'm spending a lot more time with my parents, I've been getting this a lot. You know, someday you're going to be our age. And they say it like it's the biggest threat they can use. There's no more, someone's going to get the belt. Because now the response is, <laughs> please, this finely tuned can of mine can take it. So they just say, someday you're going to be our age. And let me tell you, if they do say it as a threat, it works. It legitimately freaks me out. And it's all I think about for the next, like, two days. (laughs) Someday I'm going to be in my 50s. No! 
Because what I do now, what our generation does now, affects how things play out when I reach that age. Now I'm sure some of you are getting freaked out as well. <laughs> because someday in the future, I hope to be a parent. Yeah, Lord help that kid. And I'll be doing the typical dad stuff. I'll walk into my living room someday after taking my robot butler in for a tune-up. It's not that impressive. Everyone is going to have one by 2018. And then my teenage daughter will be watching TV and some teen pop singer will be on the screen doing everything I've taught my girl not to do. And I'll say, Hermione! <laughs> you bet that's what her name's going to be. <laughs> Hermione, is that, uh, is that that Miley Cyrus? And Hermione will say, Hashtag silly dad, hashtag SMH, hashtag it's Anna Fontana, hashtag get with it, hashtag Miley who, hashtag OMG need Pinkberry. I hate hashtags. You think I'm exaggerating, but I do think that's how people will talk. I mean, we're doing it now. Like, okay. When the Boston Marathon bombing happened, ESPN was running stories on it. I was watching one, and Steve Levy was there on site wrapping up a very serious, you know, pretty emotional piece. This is how he signed off. Many people have been affected by the tragic events that have transpired here this week. So as a sports community, as a nation... We must band together and give our full support to the people and city of Boston. For ESPN, I'm Steve Levy. Hashtag Boston Strong. He said that on the air! His Twitter information was running through the bottom of the screen with the stupid bright blue bird. Tweet at Steve Levy. Like, is there any worse way to wrap up a serious story about a tragic event? I'm telling you, ne next election... The new president will be giving the State of the Union address like my hashtag fellow Americans. During the applause breaks, tweet at prez underscore boss status flashes on the screen. <sighs> so anyway, I'll go to Pinkberry. <laughs> Get my stupid spoiled kid or cucumber mint Pinkberry smoothie. And while I'm gone, she'll look up Miley Cyrus on Wikipedia. Don't ask me how, but Wikipedia will still be around despite all the robots. And she'll read, Miley Cyrus was an American actress and singer. Gained national attention in 2013 for twerking on Robin Thicke at the VMAs. And she'll say, when I come back, she'll say, Hashtag dad. Hashtag dad. Hashtag, what's hashtag twerking? And I'll say, oh, it was kind of like the Charleston. It was a way for young women to rebel against their parents. And it was very frowned upon and should never be repeated again. So yeah, if that scenario doesn't freak you out and make you want to change your ways, I don't know what will. Because it absolutely terrifies me. Seriously, I, hashtag, I just don't get it. I think there'll be one one occasion where I might go ahead and have a hashtag. It'll be a very special, specific scenario. I'm going to be in the hospital for some reason. And I'm going to be in the hospital bed with the gown and everything like that. But I'm going to be wearing a top hat. I'm going to have all a bunch of friends around me, you know. Give them the thumbs up, maybe have like a bottle of champagne or something like that. And I'm going to put that picture on Facebook. And I'm going to wait for someone to comment and say, Oh my gosh, what happened? And my reply will be, Hashtag Bostioporosis. Woo! Hurdy. I know, I know. You go ahead and take that one if you want. Compliments of me. But that will be the only time. I swear. Okay. Now that I let that out. Moving on! Uh, a lot of comedians do a lot of airplane humor, and then I guess some people are getting tired of it, which saddens me because I got plenty of airplane material because my dad is a pilot. So, I don't know. I'll, I'll try this one on for size anyway. So, 
because my dad's a pilot, I've been able to fly a lot. I get to fly for free so long as it's on his airline. And I can already tell I'm probably pissing off some of you. Whatever. The downside is that I have to fly standby. So I don't have a guaranteed spot unless everyone else has boarded and I'm high enough on the standby list to grab an open seat. Yeah, now, now things even out. Kinda. I don't know if you've, flown, if you've flown standby or not, but it is scary how much that experience changes you. You really do become a completely different person until you get on that plane. First off, you already ticked about waiting in line at security. I mean, we can all relate to this. It's really only 20 minutes, but it feels like an hour. And it's not like the flight will leave earlier the sooner you get to the gate. But still, you're like, oh, great. Stuck behind another fat guy. This won't take forever. I could drive to Omaha and the time will take this bro to bend over and get his shoes off. You should be thinking, what am I doing going to Omaha anyway? So you get through security and you hurry to your gate while spewing all these mean, hateful thoughts in every which way, every direction about all these people who are such an inconvenience for you. It's like, ah, this lady with four kids taking up the whole hallway. She's probably Catholic! Oh, you, you think this was the best way to wear a burqa? What are you hiding anyway? Oh, what's this guy smiling about? Probably because he made his flight. Just has everything handed to him. And it seems like there's always like a break in the traffic. And it's just one really attractive person walking by, you know, his or herself. So even though you finally have some space to really get up and go, you decide to just slow down, play it cool. Maybe take out your phone, be like, oh yes, uh, the merger went very well. Yes, we can expect six figures. Ladies, oh yes, I'm just so ready to be single this weekend. <laughs> like it's going to make any difference. But then it's back to this. Oh, this guy wearing tennis shoes. Use them! So you finally get to your gate huffing and puffing. You check your phone. Because watches are only fashion accessories these days, let's be honest. Then you say, oh, look at that, I have another 45 minutes. Whew. Now, for most people, this concludes their hectic day at the airport. They take their seat, relax. The only worries they have left are if they'll get stuck to a ba next to a baby on the plane. <laughs> stuck to a baby. Even worse. Maybe some of you worry about that. Or they worry about if they can get away with ordering the vegetarian meal, since it's always better. For us standby people, however, we're, we're only halfway through this battle. When we get to the gate, we stand about 15 feet away from the ticket counter and strike the standby pose. You know, hand on the hip, other hand on the luggage, all the weight on one side, and just looking straight at the screen. And then we wait for that standby list to come up. Now this goes one of two ways. We already have an idea of how many seats are open on the flight. If there are five open seats and I'm let's say first, second, maybe even third on the list, I, f I feel pretty good. I then get to relax and focus on my white people problems. If I'm fourth or lower, <laughs> whoa, different story. Contrary to what you may perceive so far, I'm generally a nice guy. But in this situation, I can't think of a single positive quality about anyone. Every single person I see going up to the counter or striking the pose is the enemy, and I hate all of them. I, all the last names are abbreviated on the screen, but I imagine I like, play them out in my head. Be like, okay, was it Birmingham? Birmingham's fourth. Who is he? Oh, I bet that's Birmingham. Guy in the glasses. What's he hiding anyway? Oh, oh, that that guy getting getting a ticket. Are you kidding me? I'm here in my Kenneth Cole luggage and my, you know, nice dress shoes, Sunday best. He's wearing sneakers. Hasn't cut his hair since Nam. A backpack, please. I deserve that ticket. But eventually, it all ends. And either I'm sitting down waiting for the next flight, 
or I'm on the plane and get to relax next to that crying baby because I always end up sitting next to that thing. One day, one time when I was visiting my brother in Fort Lewis, Washington, I was stuck at the Seattle Tacoma airport for, not kidding, 13 hours. It was a miracle I even got home because what happened was that I eventually, I kept getting pushed back to these other flights, but so did a bunch of other people. And I was actually getting lower and lower on the standby list. I was all the way down to 36th as at one point. I was like, this is ridiculous, but I don't really see any other way. So waiting for, you know, possibly my last hope, I had maybe an hour and a half or so until they started boarding. I fell asleep in the chair. That was awkward. But I wasn't planning on getting on the flight anyway. I wake up to them actually announcing passenger hurt, passenger hurt. I wake up, I'm like, oh, idiots, it's hurty. Oh, wait, that's me. And I w- go up there, and it turns out literally everyone in front of me had switched over to a different flight. <laughs> True act of God. Thanks, big guy. Oh, that totally reminds me. So, this story actually happened. I am not making any of this up, but it totally ties in with not only my little airplane anecdotes, but also about this whole poor generation example thingy I was on earlier. Uh, My last flight, I I forget where I was traveling. I'll be honest, it's been a while, but I was on the kiss and fly uh, at Chicago O'Hare and I'm waiting to get to my terminal and there's this woman and a little boy uh, in the same car as me and we're you know chucking along we stop at terminal one and this young lady probably mid-20s uh, hops hops on looks like she worked at the airport had the uniform on and everything and she takes a seat across from this woman and her little boy. And, you know, everyone's usually like really quiet and stays to themselves during these sort of things. But this lady comes on the train and she's, you know, very polite. She starts, you know, talking to the little kid like, Hi, what's your name? Where are you going? You know, it was cute to see her interact with the kid. And she's like, How old are you? And the mom answered, he just turned three. And she goes, oh, three? That's a big birthday. Well, I think that deserves a present. And she pulls out a wad of cash. And she gets, I think, two dollar bills was what it was. Yeah. She gives this kid two bucks. And the mom, I kid you not, goes... Well, I don't know what we're going to get with that, but what do you say? It blew my mind that she would say something like that. (laughs) First of all, this little kid just put in more work than what most homeless people in Chicago get. Okay, two bucks, that's a pretty big deal. Second, she gave the money to the kid. That is his to, that's his that he earned for being adorable not yours for being some stuck-up, terrible person. Don't know what we're going to get with that. You have any idea how many Tootsie Rolls that buys? That kid is king for a day. It's it's not even your money. Oh, I, I couldn't believe it. I It was everything I could do to just sort of like remain in that awkward standing on the train pose. But my gosh, people these days, idiots. Ugh. So I've been listening to a lot of rap lately. <laughs> That's not a 360. Um, it just kind of came with an observation. I kind of took a break from it for a while, but now it's kind of like, oh, rap music. Yeah, why not? I think I listen to it because I it's easy for me to relate, you know? Sometimes rappers will say stuff like, rubber band banks. I'm like, yeah, my wallet's broken too. Or like, presidents in my wa- presidents in my pocket. It's 
like, yeah. Abraham Lincoln's on the penny, right? Yeah, I got presents in my pocket. My personal favorite is popping bottles. I freaking love popping bottles, okay? You ever had Coke when it comes out of a bottle? Oh, to die for. Not Pepsi, though. That stays in the can. <sighs> oh, speaking of the cans. Um, sorry, this is how my brain works. Actually, no, I won't apologize for that. This is who I am. Uh, so at work, we have people who can drop off cans and also sorts of aluminum, copper, steel, all that good stuff, and we'll give them money for it. And I've been working on this little project uh, because I work with a couple of Mexicans who don't speak much English, one of them being Chante. And I wanted to get Chente to say, as just like the whitest voice possible, Hi, may I help you? And then that'll be that'll be it. So this past week, I said, you know what, we're ready to test this bad boy out. Someone came in and they had cans to drop off along with a couple other things. And I'm like, hey, Chente, go take this one. So Chente goes over there. And I'm just in the background, like, pretending to look like I'm working, but, like, yeah, it's work. I got better things to do. So I'm taking this in from afar, and I see Chente go up there. He goes, hi, may I help you? And the guy starts talking, and I can tell it's already, like, a complex situation. And Chente just says, hi, may I help you? I didn't tell him to do it. He just kept saying it. And I'd start, you know, holding my sides. And this guy's starting to get a little more frustrated. So he finally spots me. He said, also Chente said, hi, may I help you? Like three more times. And then the guy sees me. He says, excuse me. He like waves me over. I'm like looking around until I, you know, walk over says uh yes i'm trying to and he starts going into this thing i don't know he had to like sort some copper aluminum i don't know what the heck it was i wasn't really paying attention because i was focused on just staring at him and then i said lo siento pero no hablo inglés (laughs) oh man (laughs) the look on his he just like threw up his hands was like oh my gosh (laughs) he went stomping back into the office Got Tomas to come out. Tomas is actually Tom, by the way. We just call him that. But so Tom helped him out. Me and Shente got into a little bit of trouble, but it was worth it. We just we're just not allowed to do it again. But so worth it. All right, looks like we're about out of time. Oh, I did wanna. This came to mind the other day. Uh. I was talking with my friend, Brittany, and I was reminded of this funny little story that happened at her place. Uh, we, she was having some friends over, uh, it was her, Jane, and I waiting for other people to show up. And they pulled out, I guess, this card game that they have that just has like a bunch of random questions they're like conversation starters because apparently you need conversation starters when I come over to your house (laughs) pretty awkward guy and one of the questions was if you had a sex change for an hour what would you do and I thought my first thought was do people actually do this (laughs) Did someone just read way into Mrs. Doubtfire and White Chicks to think that it'd actually be a good idea? But then I looked past that, and honestly, my serious answer was, I would prepare dinner and clean the house in one hour just to prove that it could be done and you could stop your whining about it, ladies. Thank you very much. My name's Joe Herdy. It's been a blast. I'll see you later.